afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know me, I'm Pauline Allen, and I'm the chair and, and founder of the International Light Day. And for those who do know me, hi to all of you. I'm absolutely delighted to be here to inaugurate our first International Light Day, um, which is celebrated today at the Equinox and will be celebrated annually at the Equinox. Um, I felt that we take light for granted. It's a phenomenon, it happens every day, and I thought it would be nice to celebrate it in a special way. And um, that's what we're doing today for the first time. So hopefully, each and every year, we'll be able to celebrate light, and light being in all its manifestations. So, I thought about how we could celebrate our first International Light Day and possible subsequent ones. I want some feedback from you. So I invited each and every member of the organisation to submit a case study about their work. And we've had 23 case studies submitted, which has resulted in this booklet, which we are um, going to give you today after my presentation, and uh, we hope that they will grow, but I think it's a very good idea to have a look at what your colleagues are doing when they work with light, because we all meet annually, talk about our work, but we thought it would be a very powerful tool to have a collection of case studies that we can all refer to and show other people, show our clients, show our peers, show um, whoever we need to, academic, uh, uh, um, for research purposes in the future. This isn't a research uh, booklet, I have to say. Um, so that we have a collation of our work here and when we come together and talk together about what we do, I think this puts rather a different spin on seeing how powerful some of these case studies are. So we're going to be presenting some of those case studies to you. Um, and this is our lovely newborn baby. We've had lots of uh, sweat, very few tears in making this happen. And I have to thank some people Simon Hansen, who has always worked on our case study booklet, has worked tirelessly to bring this small booklet together. Although it's a very small booklet, it took a lot of work. And I guess it's a work in progress. So I hope you enjoy having a copy of this yourself. And I'd like to also thank Lynn Dorr, who was a brilliant um, inspiration for Simon and very helpful in its production, and our brilliant uh, president, Aladi, um, who has helped and facilitated this. I'd also like to thank uh, Heather Benguet in our office in London and Bill Stickler, my husband, who helped with some of the editing and uh, quite a few other uh, things that we had to do to make this happen. We hope that in the coming year we're going to evolve the uh, International Light Day and I'm going to be asking today um, perhaps we can have a bit of a brainstorm as to how you might like to celebrate International Light Day in the future. Although I put out um, a call for uh, ideas and information, I didn't get a single response. So today's light event, uh, International Light Day, will get better and better every year, I'm sure, with lots of uh, input. Um, I think in the coming year we might think about how we can use the booklet, perhaps have a, a diary calendar in, in, in there, which perhaps someone would like to sponsor each month, a different um, monthly sponsorship. You might like to include your courses that you're going to give over the year, because although we have laptops and um, um, telephones and uh, all kinds of uh, mobile 
uh, information about what we're doing all the time, it's very nice to have a hard copy that we can refer to and show to other people. So I hope you uh, can think of some nice ways um, to celebrate uh, International Light Day and to use the booklet in the future. So I've asked some of the presenters, uh, some of the uh, people who have included their, we have included the case studies in our booklet to present to us today the case study that is in the booklet. Sadly, and not all of them can be here today, so we either have um, video presentations, and in one case I'll read, uh, I'll read the case study. But for those that are not on this list and have their case study included, can you please stand up? Thank you. Great. Um, please, no, stay, will you stay standing up, please, because I'd like you to introduce yourself, say where you come from, and um, the light therapy that you use, and what you do. So we'll start with Teresa. Oh, I'm, I'm giving a short uh, talk about me tomorrow in the forum, so shall I wait for tomorrow? Well, no, I'd like you to say, this, this is about your case study. My case study. Oh, okay. well. Yeah, yeah. So just, okay, I'm Teresa Sunt, I come from England, born in Greece. Uh, my experience is as an art teacher, uh, trained in Rudolf Steiner, as a Rudolf Steiner teacher, and also with Theo Gimbel and other color therapists. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been working with light, uh, working for a company that sells light, but my, uh, I work mainly these days with people with painting and color to try to balance um, their whole psychology and also um, illnesses and well, not illnesses, but um, physical things. So it's basically through color and painting that I work more these days. And that's my case side about it. Thank you. Well, hi, I'm Gabrielle Wurisch Teichmann. I'm working in, in Vienna, Austria. I'm a color light addict. <laughs> I'm working since 26 years with colors and since 20 years as color light therapist. So I'm a color consultant and color light therapist both. Um, I, my first training as a light therapist was with, was, uh, with Theo Gimbel 20 years ago. Uh, then I trained with uh, Jacob Lieberman and I've been working with his method, with his SRS uh, light device for 10 years. And since uh, two and a half years, I'm working with a monochrome color dome uh, of Karl Rieberg. Uh, and I'm also doing workshops with him. And my case study uh, is a case of um, a woman who came to me and she was, uh, uh, I would say she had a kind of a burnout. And I did, um, I think it was only five, four or five sessions of monochrome color dome. But combined with my other counseling or therapeutic work, I'm a systemic uh, constellation facilitator. So I did a family constellation with her and I did inner child work. And to find out which colors I, are needed, I'm using Theo Gimbel's Hygia Color Spine Chart Test. So um, this case I, I reported on was very efficient because this lady was getting well, I think it was in a period of three or four months, with only uh, four monochrome sessions, one color constellation, one constellation, family constellation, and my other counseling work. So this is for me a case that uh, uh, getting well for this lady went extremely quick, within three months, and only a couple of sessions. Thank you. Uh, I'm Christiane, also from Vienna. <laughs> I'm a colleague of Gabriel, and I've been working with colors for also more than 25 years now. Uh, starting, I've studied something else, but uh, sometime I started to uh, get on with color consulting for dresses and for rooms and for buildings and so on. And this didn't um, 
isn't enough for me because I realize color works out and I I am a color maniac like you all, uh -huh. like we all are. And so I jump deeper into the, the theme. And now I, I realize that people may change just by wearing another color uh, on their body or being surrounded by another color. And this was so extraordinary, this experience, that I thought uh, you must use color around your whole body and I was thinking of rooms with colors and after some years uh, the form of the pyramid uh, arose in my inner um, realization and so I combined a light color and form in the colored light pyramid which I designed and uh, have it produced. I have it now, and, and there you can lie in, it's big, it's three square meters or two square meters and has the shape of a pyramid and in the construction you have the light built in and you may choose any color you want uh, for the moment or you can make a re 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 uh, remote, uh, revolving, how do you say, changing light. Uh, so this is, was my idea and it took me five years to work on it, to make prototypes, to fail and begin again. Um, yes, and uh, there I had a lady with a severe hormonal disorders. She hadn't had her period for half a year or so. And she was lying in the pyramid and after, I think it was six weeks about, where she used to go into the pyramid, everything came back. And I really was so happy. And uh, it's now two years ago, and it still works. So this is my case. Thank you. Hello, I'm Eva de Jong. I'm from Holland, from Haarlem, close to Amsterdam. And I work with the Orosoma system. I don't know if many of you have heard of it, Orosoma the color therapy. Yeah, they have these beautiful colored bottles. Funnily enough, I just got this from the car to show to someone, so just to give you an impression. Uh, there are by now 111 different bottle, uh, bottles with two color combinations in them, as you can see. And um, I think it is a beautiful reflection of the us as human beings, as colorful beings that we are. So Orosoma offers you a mirror to look into and to see yourself reflected in light. And this is also what happened to the girl who came to me, which was my case study that I put uh, for the booklet. Uh, there's this young woman uh, coming out of school, going on a trip and um, then getting into a very bad state of psychosis. And after, before she went on this trip, she already went to see me once just for fun and to see what Orosoma had to offer her. And then after the trip, after her psychosis had happened, she came again to me uh, for real help. So I've been working with her for over three years now, and the results have been very, very beautiful and quite quick in the first instance. And now she's uh, keeping up a maintenance dose to come and see her development and also to further herself in life. So that's what I've been uh, putting into this booklet. Good afternoon, Phil Stickland, married to Pauline. We set up the Sound Learning Centre in London in 1994. We use uh, a sound therapy called Barad Auditory Integration Training, often abbreviated to AIT, and uh, light therapy uh, using the Lubaton and the Photon. Uh, our main client base is children, but not exclusively so. Um, we see quite a lot of young adults and, and older people, and our aim is to try and improve people's performance, uh, working on the basis that the sensory system, how the sensory systems function will determine to a great degree how they function, how you function, how I function. Um, if you can improve the auditory or the visual processing, and they appear to be the, the two easiest senses to work with, then you can do something to improve their performance. 
We don't work with conditions, although a lot of people come with labels, dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADD, ADHD, Asperger's, autism, but we're not working with the condition, we're working purely with the sensory systems. And as I say, if you can improve those to some degree, then you can expect some improvement in performance. And that may be social, emotional, behavioural or academic. Um, we also often see improvements in people's balance and coordination, gross and fine motor skills. So, if you can get any of those improvements, then clearly that can have a great knock-on effect on their general performance. The case study in the booklet was uh, concerning a young, uh, a young girl, I think she was nine at the time, uh, with underperformance at school, her, mainly because her reading was so very poor. And uh, she did AIT and she did light, and there was a lot of improvements. Uh, visual fields expanded rapidly or markedly. Uh, and her auditory processing improved, and that led to improved scholastic achievement and, and reading ability. Okay, I'm Lindu from uh, Adelaide in uh, South Australia, and I work with Amanda Hoffman, who's our secretary in the back. Uh, we are Sanasati light therapists. Uh, we use um, the Lumitra, uh, the Luminite system, uh, Julianne Bien. A lot of Marcel's uh, Mommy Med products, which we think are absolutely wonderful. Uh, I also have uh, an ID's small version of Sensora, the Sensorita. Um, with the um, torches, we use them on and off the body, basically on the meridians, and uh, we also use work in the field um, in, in the oil system. Um, the, client that I had um, was a, a person with multiple sclerosis um, from which he'd been suffering for a number of years to the extent that he had a wheelchair within the house um, if he ventured outside the house it was with a mobility scooter he uh, had hemiparesis he was uh, blind in the left eye half the time um, he had digestive orders, he had uh, disorders, he had elimination problems, he had restless leg syndrome even though his legs didn't seem to belong to him, he couldn't regulate his temperature, he was basically a mess. Um, and although he's an innately um, positive person, he was fairly depressed when I started working with him. Um, so, uh, I, initially I saw him twice a week doing, um, I'd start with harmonization one, which is a, a society protocol, developed from, from Mandel, um, and then there'd be a toxin clearing, and then later in the week the harmonization one and immune support. And as this went on over the weeks, there would be some change that wasn't just applying the protocol as it is because Samasati you actually interact with the energy of the client and you start to feel that you need to use something else. Um, so it, it, I think it was probably about two months that I worked with him twice a week and then went to once a week and we, we went on for probably the best part of the year. Um, he, uh, at this point, and that, that was um, seven, nearly eight years ago, at this point, um, the wheelchair is in the shed. The mobility scooter is used um, when he plays golf. That's the only time. Um, he has returned to teaching full time. Um, all of the um, symptoms which I mentioned in the beginning are about memories. Uh, obviously, he still has to watch his diet. He still has to and make, make sure he doesn't get too stressed and, and these sort of things. But um, he's, um, he's absolutely fine and in fact he's become a Samasati light therapist himself. I realised that when I called for people here who've given case studies, I suppose that also includes me, but I won't speak very long about the nine and a half year old um, young man with um, with Asperger's syndrome and dyspraxia, who are following the DTP vaccination, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. At three months old, he went blind. At 14 months old, his sight started to return. 
um, but his education afterwards was um, severely impaired. You can read about it in the case study booklet, but he went on to um, achieve as um, a, a ten, a ten uh, just over 10 year old, um, he was able to achieve so well at school that he had um, his work published in a book. So I won't uh, go on about that now um, anymore because I'd like to introduce you to Simon. Five years ago I was approached by my son in law Campbell, who was aware of my work with my therapy and asked for my help. He informed me that his brother Mark and his wife Carly had their baby four weeks premature on the 16th of April 2008. They had been very worried for a few weeks because their baby was not growing and finally the doctor suggested it was time to be Baby Mason was born naturally, or as naturally as he could be. One evening, Carly was resting away from the neonatal intensive care unit when she was called down. She was then informed that for some reason a contusion had occurred at the end of Mason's first finger and thumb. The first finger was much worse than the thumb. Following the ultrasound tests and consultation with neurologists and other specialists, the paediatricians told Mark and Carly that the end of Mason's fingers were, were necrotic and would drop off after a couple of months, or they'd amputate. I told him that I was willing to help out, but I would need permission to go to the hospital and treat Mason. The permission was granted and my trip to the hospital began. Most of the time my actions were noted on baby Mason's chart. I treated Mason about three times per week for the first three or to four weeks. And in the fifth to the ninth week, I treated him twice per week. His index finger was damaged to a much greater extent than his thumb. His thumb recovered after about six weeks, showing slight scarring that has now faded completely. He returned home in the fourth week, so I treated him at home. Since I was new to light therapy, it was difficult to trust my abilities. I, will, I always had either Mark or Carly holding Mason. That link I felt was important since he was so energetically young and I felt he was actually sitting in their energetic bubble, an external womb, if you like. They would hold his hand out so that I could put the light on the ends of his fingers and slowly stroke the light up and down the finger. My thinking was to encourage the blood flow back to the ends of the digits. With an adult client, client I would ask what they were feeling with each colour. Obviously, this was not possible with Mason. However, I discovered two forms of communication that were a little bit out there. The first was Mason's immediate reaction to the colour. Surprisingly for a baby, he pulled his hand away if he either felt un discomfort with a colour or had enough exposure to that colour. Secondly, I discovered that if I placed my hand behind his finger, his hand, I could feel what I would describe as an echo of the energy that Mason arguably felt, or not. I discovered fairly early in the treatment that, color, that the colour Mason preferred to begin with was indigo. Even today when dealing with injuries, indigo is needed to calm the area. My feeling is that this helps to calm down the shocked cells and the healing can't actually begin until this has occurred. This was soon followed by green, the colour for healing, and cell duplication. In Mason's case, I found that he also needed orange, or yellow if the orange was too harsh, to encourage or promote a rebuilding of the damaged flow, blood flow to the area of his fingers. I would jump from yin colours to the yang colours, indigo to green, and hold the lights there until he had had enough. Sometimes Mason was unmoved by the gentle colours, so I would try to encourage more cellular activity with harsher colours. At times, like this, his reactions displayed a wriggling disturbance. Please note that these disturbances were not anguish as we had understand it, but subtle movements that showed discomfort. On these days, I'd use peach pink with an immediate effect of settling him and making him sleep. Then he'd be able... I'd then I'd be able to continue with the other colour for a little longer before it became apparent he'd just had enough. His body language was a key indicator in these situations. 
During the seventh week, I found that Carly was becoming very tired, and I was getting less and less feedback from Mason. I contacted my teacher, Jan van der Est, and his wife, Wilma, and their response was clear. Treat the mother. The following week, I gave the mother a treatment, and the day following that, Carly phoned me to tell me Mason's finger was oozing some blood. I went to visit her and found that sure enough there was a small amount of blood coming from where the black skin joined the healthy skin. I felt this was quite safe. I reassured her of this and um, I said, I'll have another look tomorrow. The following day she phoned me quite excited and told me that she put Mason to bed the, that last evening with mittens on his hand and when she got up the following morning and took off the mittens, the black bit had gone and his finger looked quite normal. To this day, the index finger that had more damage than the thumb does show a slight shortening of the end and the fingernail curls over the end to a small extent, but nothing more. The whole experience was key to my understanding of light and how the body responds to its maintenance and confidence in my own self to read signs of my client beyond words. That helped me understand what is required Thank you for listening. Well, that's a brilliant case study to start with and uh, delight, delightful to hear Simon's voice in this room with us, yeah. even though he's at uh, some distance. He's very sorry he can't join us. Um, so we can tell him how well received his uh, case study was. Um, our next case study is um, by a young man from California called Don Boninsky, who is uh, a doctor of optometry and uh, a, a wonderful guy. Thank you. It was about uh, the case about uh, a 62-year-old gentleman who 30 years before had been hit in the eye with a tennis ball. And he had a loss of seeing in his lower left visual fields and he was a um umpire for the baseball team so when the ball would come in that area if you were the batter it was always a ball but if you were the other team it was always a strike <laughs> so we had difficulty and so we provided uh, syntonic light therapy for him and we were actually able to uh, neutralize blind area, shall we say. It was kind of like a relative scotoma, what we call. And uh, I, I can help you better with showing you some of what we've done. We used the John Downing's Lumatron, and we saw him for like 20 sessions. And I do a, an area that we, we call nascentization. We kind of prep the person to be able to receive the light. And we put, have them watch white light and put a, a red lens on one eye and a blue lens on the other to disrupt the normal processing that the visual system has for, for light and color. It's called nascentization. And then after that, so, so that was for uh, the red blue glasses, and then I gave him ruby. Ruby is a very interesting color. It's a mental balancer, so to speak, and because he was concerned about that, and the actual light that we used to treat the condition was the yellow green light, which we used for eleven minutes. And that was on each visit, and we saw him for 20 visits. Hit by the eye, 30, it was 30, 32 years before. And the lesion, it's, he saw pretty well. His, his visual acuity, ability to see small detail was 20, 25 in the left eye, and 20, 20 in the right eye. And this is a photograph of his retina, or as we call it a fundus photograph. And these, there's the optic nerve, and these were the lesion areas over here. This was 
on July 8th of that year that we saw him. This was his, uh, one of his visual fields of that left eye. We used what's called a, a frequency doubling technology. And it's kind of like a white light that flashes on and off. So it gives critical fusion frequency plus the sensitivity to light and then decrease that or increase the light intensity to tell what their thresholds are. It's a very sensitive area. And kind of showed some of these areas here that had a loss and there's a numerical component with those also. And then I did uh, campimetry with the color visual fields and got large enough the white field was out here but the color field seemed to be limited in this same area right in here. And this is his normal blind spot area which is a little bit distorted and the color relationships with the red, green, and blue are a little bit out of phase. So there's not much difference in the actual photo. This was before and this is after. I don't know if it was a difference in the photo that was actually taken or the lesions actually changed. I'm going to be frank with you, okay? Uh, but there's not a huge difference, but if you sit down and have a cup of coffee and look at these, there may be some areas that was decreased a little bit. But the exciting thing was the increase in the visual field. Which, again, this has the same quadrant area, the whole area, this 30 degree area. This was before. These were the areas that were not performing properly and they had cleared up. And if we look at the numerical components also, then the whole system was rebalanced back, which was very interesting. And this again was his initial visual field with the campimeter, and this was afterwards then, and these had opened up, and the relationships of the color had rebalanced also, and the normal blind spot here. So. The bottom line was that he was, he was really happy because now he could see in that area. And he enjoyed baseball more. <laughs> That's the bottom line in all this. And as I tell everybody, what do we do? What do we do? We help people make money and have fun. <laughs> help people make money and have fun. <laughs> pretty, pretty practical about all this stuff. And that's my wife and I, Susan, and, and our little dog here rides in the motorcycle, too. So. so that's part of this having fun component. Okay, and I'm waving goodbye to everyone. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for the doc, that, Don. Great. Okay. Um, our next case study is from uh, Premo in Canada, who also sadly can't be with us today. We'll just load it up and uh, get going with that. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi, family. I am very happy to uh, present you uh, this uh, little talk uh, about pain man management using the central light uh, sessions. For me, it's very exciting to uh, discover that it could work with pain. We have a lot of uh, example, example of uh, working with depression, and uh, but pain we didn't know about. Uh, so, and we have, we have a lot of example. I choose one, and for sure, I, sh I choose the miraculous one, <laughs> because uh, it's a uh, very, uh, interesting uh, case. Um, it's uh, a woman, she was diagnosed uh, with uh, uh, inflammatory breast cancer, uh, which really is uh, also now bone cancer and uh, very painful for sure. And uh, also she uh, uh, she refused because it was a stage 4 palliative care 
so she refused any uh, chemo or radiotherapy. Uh, now we are in uh, 2013. She's still very much alive. And uh, uh, she's still there, very much alive and uh, functional, which is amazing. At home, driving your car. And uh, when uh, she came for central session uh, last year, she was uh, bedridden, deep depression, a lot of pain with a lot of mm, uh, drugs. Uh, and now she's just done uh, fentanyl uh, patches. She could uh, stop all the pain medication after a few weeks of treatment, which is uh, for me miraculous. For her, it was also. Uh, the treatment uh, of uh, this woman is uh, very simple. Actually, it's uh, she's coming. Uh, every three days uh, and uh, first we started to, to use uh, lateral light uh, when she was really uh, uh, anxious uh, and depressed I started with the reverse which is more for anxiety because she could not sleep she was waking up a lot of the time so we choose that first. Then for pain, which is working quite well uh, with uh, neuropathic pain and uh, cancer, um, palliative care. And um, so we use the fire within. And then one session really to bring back energy uh, which is a five minute very uh, energetic core session. Um, so it's really the person who comes out really uh, uh, more alive, ready to go uh, and do things uh, she could not do before, like just cleaning uh, her house. Uh, and she can go and also uh, do her shopping she could not drive a car before, now she can drive and uh, she's uh, full of energy and uh, ready to uh, die for sure because the cancer is uh, really uh, uh, having its toll on her health and now the bones are breaking mm -hmm. and uh, it's not so easy but still she can, uh, she's at home and uh, she's uh, really uh, happy, uh, she's feeling blessed to be able to look at death in a peaceful, peaceful way uh, with much less pain and uh, totally relaxed, relaxed and not depressive and no more angry because she didn't want to die uh, with this anger. Uh, for her it was like poisoning her life. So she came this morning with a big smile and very bright eyes and uh, she uh, is uh, accepting what she's going through in a very peaceful way manner and uh, this is uh, such a pleasure for me to see that lights and colors can can be so beneficial where medicine cannot do much and uh, so for me uh, i'm very happy to share that with you with the light family because i feel uh, all those uh, examples uh, that we share help us a lot to go ahead, to have the strength and the courage to open new ways to treat people and to explore, to experiment. And for sure, for me, it's the medicine of the future. So uh, I hope you enjoy
enjoy your time together. I'm sorry not to be able to be there, but I'm there with my heart, with you, and uh, see you at another time. Thank you very much. Our next case study is our uh, only environmental case study uh, in our case studies booklet and um, I'm very uh, pleased to present uh, Professor Abraham Hay. Thank you. So as the polling say, it's a little bit different than the other case studies. We don't study humans, uh, we study environmental effects of light on an animal model in relation to breast cancer. This is a paper for, which was published in 2005 by Christian Kajochen from Sleep Laboratory in Basel. And what Christian showed was if you expose people to a dark and then you expose them, this is at 7 o'clock in the evening, 7.30 in the evening, two hours later, he separated them into three different groups. This is blue, green, yellow, or uh, what you could get as 550 nanometers, 450, and this is black. We are not interfered with light. These two groups were interfering with light, but in different wavelengths. And then the protocol goes on, and you go to sleep. But what he could show is that there was no significant difference in melatonin suppression between these two groups, where in the group that was exposed to short wavelengths, there was a suppression of melatonin, body temperature didn't fall, heart rate didn't fall, which has to do with the suppression of melatonin. So, we are working on a model of uh, uh, mice that we inoculate them with breast cancer cells, mice breast cancer cells, and then we can grow them on the different illumination conditions. So, uh, this is just shows us this is from a paper that was published a few years ago, or two years ago, and we can see that what suppresses melatonin in, as an illumination is the natural white lead, white lead more than any other uh, illumination that is used. And here we have the incandescent bulb, 65 watts, but it's uh, coated with a blue color, like a blue lamp that you use. It also suppresses melatonin. So, the blue or the short wavelength has to do with melatonin suppression. So, this is the, this is from now, from a paper that was accepted for publication. We have here three groups. This is the control group, where the mice are inoculated with four T1 cells, and these are bulb mice, females, and this is the control group, the, uh, this is a group which is interfered with 30 minutes of light in the middle of the night and it's a 460 nanometers and 450 lux. This is, these are also interfered with light, the same light, but they're treated with melatonin in the drinking water in the uh, one hour before lights went off. So you can see here that we get, after 21 days, uh, we can see that the mice that were light treated with no mel melatonin, the volume of the tumor is significantly higher than the ones that were treated with melatonin and the control one. And this is in 21 days. As we inoculate the cells under the skin, we can have a continuous measurement of the volume of the tumor. And this is what we can see there. Now, we have another experiment using 
incandensed bulb. What we were using till 40, 50 years ago, and now for the last two years it's forbidden to sell them back at home, and we can buy only up to 60 bucks. So this is these results resemble very much the ones of uh, Christian, because we have here, this is the control group that are not exposed to light. These are the ones that expose, are exposed to light, and these are the ones that are exposed to light, but treated with melatonin. So if you see here, this is after 33 or 34 days, this is after 21 days. So when the mice are kept under incandescent, illumination, the growth of the tumor is relatively very slow. Okay, we, try, we start from a high amount of cells that we inoculate the, the mice with. But you can see the effect of melatonin, which is very important. So, when we removed tumor, from the first group, or from the first experiment, and we extracted the DNA of the mice, we could see something which is interesting, is when we expose the mice to light at night, we can see that the lose, what we are measuring here is the percent of methylation of the DNA, the global DNA, we don't go still for specific genes, we look at the whole DNA, and we can see there is a loss of methyl uh, groups from the DNA, but when mice which are exposed to light at night are treated with melatonin, it brings it back to, this, to the normal level. Okay? So, we can show here that there is a genet it's an epigenetical difference and actually what light does as a mechanism, it changes the, uh, the rate of methylation. Most probably to melatonin, because we can see that when we add melatonin, we can correct it. Now, there is a good correlation, but we haven't got here really in big samples. But there is a, co a correlation between the size of the tumor and the level of hypomethylation. This is the tumor mass, okay? And when the tumor mass is high, you can see that the mice are more hypomethylated than when the size of the tumor is smaller. Now, this can be used, we think, as a, an a index or a way to scan the population. I would like to remind people who are not aware, but breast cancer takes about 10 to 15 years to develop. And if we can find the early stages when the woman is not sick yet with breast cancer and she's not identified as a sick woman, she can be treated with melatonin and maybe this can help her. So, but uh, as I say several times already in this meeting, I don't think that the medical field likes such ideas. It's not good for the medical field. And definitely not for the pharmaceutical field. And they're running the scene, not us. Yeah, so we can see here that actually what short wavelength does to our biological clock. It disrupts the clock because our clock thinks that it's midday. This is when we are exposed to the short wavelength. In the late afternoon, we are not exposed to the short wavelength. And when you use red light here, it's okay. I don't think we should use red light here. But definitely, we should not use short wavelength at this time of the day, because it's going to confuse our biological clock. So, this is what I have to say. If you want to, to listen to something that is not in the booklet in two minutes, 
So it's an, another experiment that we just are writing it now up for publication. I don't think that this would be a problem to publish. This is the fat sand rat, which is a model that we are using in, the, in our laboratory for biological rhythms. And this is a, a jet that belongs to the same family, Jervilidae. The question that we asked was, what we know now that if we interfere with light at night, it has a negative impact. What happens if we interfere with dark at daytime? And many of us like to take a nap in the afternoon, and usually we do it in a, in a dark room. Is it good or bad? So this is Psalomis obesus, the facts and drag. It was used for medical research in regards to diabetes and cataract. It has a very efficient kidney. So it was used also in many osmoregulatory studies. So this is the question that we asked, and we compared between a nocturnal species and a diurnal species. So we would give two hours of darkness in the middle of the day, and what we measure here is the body temperature. So this is when this is the daily rhythm of body temperature of Salomis obesus when it's not interfered with dark period the daytime. But when we interfere with that period, it becomes arrhythmic. And being arrhythmic in our life is bad. Okay? And, but the nocturnal animal, which actually uh, anticipates that the hours of the day, because it's a nocturnal animal, doesn't respond the same way. It shows a shift but it doesn't become arrhythmic. So, thank you for your attention. When, when we were preparing the case studies booklet, Premo um, said, hang on, can we wait a little bit? She's improving and she's improving and she's improving. So I've actually invited uh, Anadi today to update us since that case study um, was, was put into the booklet on this um, patient. Well, actually, because this was recorded just uh, a couple of days back, it's pretty much up to date, uh, Pauline. I mean, this woman should have died months ago. It's quite remarkable how she's uh, um, surviving this uh, terminal cancer. And we certainly wouldn't pretend that we are curing her cancer but it's making a tremendous change to her quality of life and her way of uh, dealing with the whole thing. But she comes every three days for a live session, and it happened that she, for some time she couldn't come for a week or two, and then the pain level started to increase again. And uh, she got very worried that she, uh, that was the end now, and uh, it, she couldn't come back. But she did come back for sessions on a regular basis, and it did again decrease. So it really looks like the light manages to really control the, the, the pain, which was actually very unexpected for us. We were not planning on finding this kind of result. And we've seen it not only with um, a case like this cancer, we've seen it with people with arthritic pain, with uh, fibromyalgia. So it's something we're really looking into with different people uh, and at this point. It seems to be a, a very powerful um, application of light. Um, I invited um, Mary Ross to submit her case study for presentation for today, but um, she was involved in lots of other things. So I'm actually going to read out her case study from the booklet. And um, if there are any details you want about the case study from her, I'm sure she'll be happy to answer your question. She was just unable to put the presentation like uh, Premo's together. So Dr. Mary Ross, um, in, nine, in 2008, uh, Dr. Ross switched from offering neurotherapy to her clients to offering light therapy. Different Scripts, which is her company, 
focuses on the treatment of mood disorders and specialises in the treatment of depression. Different Scripts also has an ongoing research project that explore the use of colour light with various personality and emotional problems and explores the relationship of colour preferences to various health states. So her female uh, client was 19 um, when she worked with her and she was referred uh, for treatment by a registered nurse at the centre who was a family friend of the clients that had known her most of her life. The client had a long history of depression and anxiety, bear in mind she was only 19 at the time. She was socially withdrawn and isolated from family, peer and strangers. She had numerous physical complaints and had verbalised that she thought she was dying. The only modality used was light sessions. Twelve colours were used and they were projected to the abdomen area and to the crown of the head. The client was alone in a darkened room and seated in a recliner. The order of presentation of the colours, the length of time each colour was presented, was determined by the computer program and was based on the colours the client selected in the colour preference test. The colour preference test was administered prior to each session and the session length was 27 minutes, weekly from, four, uh, from April the 30th, 2008 through to the 2nd of June 2008, with a total number of treatments at six. She kept her appointments, was on time, but she always avoided eye contact, made no spontaneous verbalisation, and responded to questions or comments with a minimal response. When Mary asked how the client was doing, she typically responded okay. She thought she was not responding, but feedback provided by her mother via the referring uh, nurse indicated she began responding with the first session and made excellent progress. After the first session, she told her mother that she didn't know she was in the light, but she'd never felt better. She went out that night to a nightclub with her friends and was more outgoing and engaging than she'd ever been. She even initiated conversation with several strangers. With the sessions, her outlook became brighter. She was less anxious and stopped having various physical complaints and no longer mentioned a fear of dying. She has continued to be more outgoing with her friends and more open and engaging with her family. Both the mother and the referring registered nurse were amazed and pleased with her progress. So, she does show a graph which uh, you can see in the case study and three years after treatment, uh, the client continues to be symptom free. She's actively involved with the family and friends, she's steadily employed since the termination of her treatment and she's now happily married with a one-year-old child. Although she never indicated to Mary, she told her mother that she attributes her changes to the light sessions. So, thank you for that case study, Mary. And uh, our next case study uh, coming up is uh, from Dr. Ed Conjot, a leading homeopathic ophthalmologist working with traditional and alternative therapies for the treatment of eye disease. Thank you, Ed. I am here live, this is not a video. And I was having withdrawal reactions because last year I missed the ILA meeting and it's great to be back with all my friends. Well, glaucoma is the third leading cause of blindness, uh, third to cataracts and macular degeneration. And according to the American uh, Ophthalmology Society, those numbers, if you look at all of them, are expected to increase from 28 million today. That's all causes a blindness of 43 million, so it's a serious issue that all of us have to really address and look at. There are three keys in the diagnosis of glaucoma, an elevation of pressure, changes in the optic nerve, and visual field loss. Unfortunately, the medical and surgical treatment only look at lowering the pressure, which I feel is really not uh, the most important aspect in treating glaucoma. We should look at circulation of the nerve 
and balancing the autonomic nervous system. And there's some research to indicate that glaucoma really be, uh, begins in the midbrain. It's not a disease of the eye. So there's more and more evidence to point that this is a disease of the autonomic nervous system, which would make light therapy a wonderful modality to treat this condition. So in order to treat glaucoma, we should not be looking at the pressure, we should be looking at the function of the optic nerve, improving blood flow to the optic nerve, neuroprotective effect, and also balancing the autonomic nervous system. Now, Don Bernetsky got me in trouble. He got me interested when he gave me this article. That was about five years ago. And this was published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology, believe it or not, in 1948, where they looked at the effect of light in the treatment of eye pressure in 1948. The bottom line is red light seems to raise the intraocular pressure of glaucoma, and green light seems to lower it. So there are two uh, approaches if you're looking at the autonomic nervous system. One is uh, high levels of green-blue shift the system to the parasympathetic, and that's kind of the allopathic approach. And low levels of red have a homeopathic effect you know, based on a lot of similars using light to treat light. And the reason why I, I choose the red end of the spectrum is, um, let's see here. In syntonics, uh, mu delta is used to treat uh, chronic uh, syndromes. It's also physiological, uh, used to treat toxins, neuroendocrine, chronic imbalance, and allergies. And I think all of those kind of fit the state of glaucoma. So in my study, I looked at 11 patients. There's the average age, 72.6. Uh, one patient had no glaucoma medication. The majority of them did have glaucoma medications. And of course, this could skew the study and affect the outcome because of the interaction with the glaucoma medications. Uh, during the testing, I asked all patients to continue their glaucoma medication. I recorded the level of their alpha omega pupil just to see if this would correlate with glaucoma, but there was no correlation. Uh, tensions or intraocular pressure was used with the Goldman tonometer, which is considered the gold standard in measuring pressure. And one thing is that um, it's, a, it's a fairly easy measurement, it's accurate, and I think it's a good indicator of success of our treatment. It's a good indicator of the physiological response to any treatment. Uh, 10 minutes of light treatment was done with the syntonic light photosynthesizer. And pressures were measured at 30 minute intervals until there was a return to the baseline. And this is the syntonic photosynthesizer that we used using U delta for 10 minutes. The results, the average pre-light pressure was 19.8. After 30 minutes, there was a drop of 15.5. Um, one hour, there was an additional drop. Uh, two hours, there seemed to be a slight stabilization. Uh, and at four hours, uh, the pressure also was low. And then uh, five hours, um, pressure was 13.7. So two patients had no significant response to the treatment, and uh, two patients returned to baseline early on in two hours. Uh, and you can see the various return to baseline over this time period. And this is a scattergram of the various intraocular pressures measured during that time period. And this is the average change after mu delta. And uh, you can see uh, that right around the three hour range is the majority of time. And it's interesting that this graph kind of corresponds with the physiological effect of most glaucoma medications. Most glaucoma medications probably have a half-life of about six hours. So why do you delta? Well, it has a weak homeopathic red effect. Um, and uh, glaucoma uh, is a chronic disease. There's an allergic and to toxic component of glaucoma and there's a neuroendocrine component. And if you're interested, uh, this study was published in the Journal of the College of uh, Syntonic Phototherapy. So thank you very much. Our uh, last case study um, presentation today 
is our own wonderful Carl Reberg from Sweden and uh, I'm sure it will be very, very interesting listening. Thank you. There will be no pictures. It's a case study in psychology and the soul being invisible. There are no pictures to show. <laughs> so, uh, so my field is how does light, colored light, affect the brain, the mind, the psyche, the soul? And most of my clients, there's nothing wrong with them. So stomach and heart and all physical conditions are okay, but they feel miserable. And many are close to committing suicides, and there's medically nothing wrong. So it's obviously in the brain, in the psyche. And the brain is extremely sensitive to light. It so proves the eye brain system. Looking at the brain, there are two structures. We've got the modern neocortex brain, but then we've got the old limbic system, reptile brain. It proves that the reptile brain in particular is extremely light sensitive. The reptile brain contains, controls blood pressure, salt, tension, temperature, hormonal level. Hundreds of biological functions are controlled by the midbrain, the limbic system, popularly known as the reptile brain. But you cannot talk to it. So this was Freud's mistake. He spent years talking to the reptile brain, but you get nowhere. The reptile brain is extremely old. The language is much younger. So you would say, reptile brain reacts to what? To light. But also to perfume, touch, sound primitive, non-verbal stimuli. And some of my clients have no language. They have been paralyzed, they have Alzheimer's, they've had accidents. They cannot even express their feelings. They can only indicate with a blink, change color. And I remember one case, I will actually give you a salad of case studies. One boy had nearly drowned 20 minutes under water and they got him out alive. But he was a vegetable. And he could only indicate by blinking which color he wanted when we scanned the spectrum. So this complete vegetable would be very interested in a mid-range orange color. And I still remember the wavelength because it was 602 nanometers. There he wanted that color. He would sit in it, beaming, smiling, and got his treatment. Came back a month later, and his only language was still just blinking. And choose exactly that very same 602 nanometers treatment after treatment and that in music is known as perfect pitch some musicians have this thing you drop a fork and say it's so <laughs> and he had perfect pitch but his brain was damaged but the old reptile brain was still intact could still communicate say i want exactly that color i want exactly that part. so we come up on patients who've lost their language who've lost contact with their emotions. And then color and light is a language. It's a very convenient language because it's international, it is non-religious, it is non-political. Everybody likes color somehow. So it sneaks into the emotional part of their brain, the feeling part of their brain. And so clients will come and see me because they're depressed, they lack courage. And one case study was a little strong girl, she was doing judo, but she never won the championships. She was the eternal number two, who trained and trained, but never got the throne. So she got her life treatments, something happens to her mental outlook, and she eventually wins that championship. So people will come for sports. Somebody will say, I'm not ill, I'm having a concert tomorrow, I have an exam tomorrow. All these effects of the human brain that medicine largely ignores because when we say is there anything wrong <laughs> we usually mean physical qualities but all about the mental emotional and what we have consistently found throughout the years i've been working more than 30 almost 40 years with like therapies that people get more intelligent we see it in the north in the winter lack of light people get tired and dumb and you feed them high quality light brain shapes up because you can say that light is like software to the brain. Most people have beautiful brains and lousy software. So you can upgrade them with good colored light. High quality light will work wonders to the brain. So many of my clients 
children who cannot perform at school, cognitively impaired, start performing and becoming intelligent, also solving their problems instead of complaining about their problems, which is a very common situation for the patient. They solve it. And biologically, let me show some of the research that Andre Mestre made in Budapest that the brain actually generates new neuronal circuit, the brain grows throughout life, and it learns structures. And the case study that I submitted, it's along the same line, it's very similar to the young girl that we heard. This is a lady in her mid 40s, 50s, heavily depressed. Stomach ulcer, migraines, anything, but nothing wrong. Uh, she's extremely anxious, nervous, sleeping pills, but she's a nobody. She's completely grey, black, hides, camouflage, uh, has very low self esteem. Then we start to work with the light. The light system we operate with, the monochrome system, you only get light once a month. Much like in homeopathy, the light treatment is 10 minutes. Once a month is usually sufficient after four treatments normally. So she gets her four treatments. And you see this little grey mouse starts to blossom. She was working as a graphic designer and she was a good designer. So her boss says, I want you to make a presentation for our customers. And, you, and she got dead nervous and says, no, I cannot do that. And eventually she gets the courage, she makes that presentation, everybody likes her, she's now a well-known person. But I've seen people come out of these crippled states of mental inertia, fear, the low self-esteem, anxiety, phobias that block their lives. And the change can be ever so quick, because we've had cases of, say, 10 minutes light treatment. Heavy depression comes in, I had one case, a young boy came to see me and he was decided he was going to commit suicide, but he wanted some advice on the smoothest way to do it, whether it would be better to buy a pistol or a rope, but okay, gets his light treatment, then 15 minutes later there's a knock on the door again, and the reception, so I go out and open, there he is, now he's bought flowers, and a big hug, and a big laugh, and depression was gone. The depression can leave in a few minutes, and that is gone. The philosophical idea behind the light therapy is that the colors we use are the colors you will see in the rainbow in a spectrum. They are very pure. They are also very beautiful. So beauty in itself is a very strong therapeutic factor. Many people live in ugly worlds. They believe they are ugly. They live in hideous cities. Seeing beauty, the angel of beauty, the angel of perfection, will trigger something. Plato speaks about this. He called it the world of absolutes. We all remember it in our dreams. The perfect world of beauty, truth, strength, what have you. Color can take you back to that. And in English, the magic English language, you actually say you remembered. You are remembered instead of being dismembered, which is much worse. You are not, I remember. Yes, now my brain is functioning again. So that is a very important aspect. It's difficult to prove. There are no statistics because the soul casts no shadow. This, you cannot measure the soul. So also this idea that we must measure life, we must measure nature, it's an old idea that goes back to Descartes. Because many aspects of life can never be measured. And that is also the magic of color and light. It goes beyond the measure and beyond the mathematics, beyond the statistics. And that is the aspect of beauty and the aspect of fun, working with young children, teenagers. They want it to be fun. They will never sit for half an hour in a boring session or something. So it must be beautiful, fascinating, touch the imagination. And uh, I would say that's the magic of color and light. It's quick. It's fun, it's beautiful, it appeals to everybody. They may not know why, because the subconscious is enormous. And we may not need the explanation, because it works anyway. And I've seen this happen again and again. So the principle in our light therapy is we let the patients choose the colors they want. So they can choose whatever they want, it doesn't really matter, as long as they're happy. 
Because much like the stomach feeds on chemical, and we call that food, the brain feeds on light, and we call it color. But we eat different food, and so we eat different colors, of course. So we assign no significance. Red doesn't mean anything, and grain doesn't mean anything. It's much like asking a musician, what's the meaning of F major? Well, it's a key of connotation. It doesn't have any meaning per se. Color may be beyond words. And very often the psychological patient is caught in a game of words. They can explain everything, but they don't live. Color takes you out of this maze of words, of riddles that lead to nowhere. You touch it. And it's like you say in Islam. There's a Muslim Sufi proverb that goes that it's, most people have read the menu, but they have never tasted the food. <laughs> but, mm, now you touch that, and you see it, and you feel it, and that is not measuring. And I will finish my presentation with a slightly sexist joke, actually. Because I see nature like the goddess of nature, and I would treat her like a woman. And if I meet a beautiful woman, I wouldn't start measuring, and weighing, and taking her temperature, because that would be a very bad start of a romance. There is so much more to life than mathematics. Oof. Thank you. Okay, so you've now had a taster of uh, our case studies um, uh, booklet and um, hopefully when you're working with light in the future you might think, hmm, this might make a good uh, future case study. So um, I mentioned some of the ideas for um, possible uh, future uh, ILD, International Light Day. But um, towards the end of the presentation, I'd love to hear from you if you do have any ideas. We could um, do a bit of brainstorming um, uh, about this. Uh, we did intend to have a glossary, which didn't quite make it into this time's case study booklet, but everyone's details are listed in it. If we don't have too much time for brainstorming today, please let... Uh, Anadi and I have your thoughts um, for future uh, events and uh, case study booklet. So I'm always looking out for um, um, interesting uh, articles and work that um, may have been published. And I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the book, The Reason I Jump, by Naoki Higashida, which has recently been published in English. He's a young boy from Japan, and he wrote about his experiences with autism um, when he was 13. He's 20 or 21 now, but the book, book's just been published in English. So. I'm going to actually read you some excerpts from the book because it's very applicable to how he thinks about light. And um, please, um, please bear with me while I read these to you. So, in my work, our work, we work with children every day and we see the effects that uh, using light therapy and sound therapy can have in making a difference in their lives of children and adults. But listening to what um, Naoki says in his book is a whole different ball game because he feels, we can't feel what he feels. And so he feels these effects which we work to help and he gives us his insights. So. Um, I, I thought it might be nice to listen to these wonderful insights that come from Naoki's book. Unfiltered direct light sort of needles its way into the eyeballs of people with autism in sharp straight lines, so we see too many points of light. This actually makes our eyes hurt. Light wipes away our tears, and when we're bathed in light, we're happy. Perhaps we just love how its particles pour down on us. Light particles somehow console us. 
this is an absolutely beautiful thought uh, that he's given us his insight into how light affects um, not only him but others with autism and if any of you are familiar with uh, autistic people you may often see them doing this perhaps filtering the light there are many reasons for this um, so we, we know from our work that working with individuals with autism with light therapy and sound therapy can help them um, to, to change and improve their lives, life. So I just want to move on to something else that he said about the power of green. So he says, our fondness for nature is, I think, a bit different to everyone else's. I'm guessing that what touches you in nature is the beauty of the trees and the flowers and things. But to us people with special needs, nature is as important as our own lives. The reason is that when we look at nature, we receive a sort of permission to be alive in the world and our entire bodies get recharged. However often we're ignored and pushed away by other people, nature will always give us a good big hug here inside our hearts. The greenness of nature is the lives of plants and trees. Green is life, and that's the love, and that's the reason we love to go for walks. So that's uh, that's another beautiful statement from him, and we know that green is a a, a common colour for many people. So. I've called some of these uh, interesting articles like like facts, so I hope you're going to enjoy listening to them. Because last month, this man who is um, he, he sorry, did someone okay? Um, he's a comedian, a satirist, and a writer. His name is Rory Bremner, and he was very um, famous for satirising uh, one of our prime ministers, namely Tony Blair. Uh, over a period of time. So it's only since a relative was diagnosed with uh, ADHD that Rory Bremner felt that at the age of 52 he'd been suffering with ADHD the whole of his life. <laughs> he felt that the condition should be called attention overload disorder. His ambition is to make a documentary where he takes Ritalin to show its effects what he describes as a chemical quash, and bring more information about ADHD to public awareness. Bremner states that if he himself had been given a chemical quash when he was young, his creative juices would not have flowed, and he feels it would have uh, impacted on his career negatively. So he's really talking about natural methods, so perhaps we should suggest uh, once he does his, um, his experiment with using his chemical kosh, that perhaps we give him some light to uh, counter the effects. So this is a light light fact on pain relief. So it seems that the medical establishment are coming around to the idea that light can help in pain management. This is an article from the Daily Telegraph in, in London just last month in August. Professor Thomas Toll, a pain specialist a pain in Munich, is beginning a trial using specially designed overhead lighting that imitates a blue summer sky. Chronic pain is a huge problem worldwide, with over 14 million sufferers in the UK alone, according to the Chronic Pain Policy Coalition. It is defined as pain that persists beyond the normal time for healing, i.e. after surgery, or that occurs in diseases such as fibromyalgia, and chronic pain of unknown cause. Dr. Tom Smith, consultant in pain medicine at Guy's and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust in London, was quoted as saying, 30% of patients will also have a depressive disorder, 30% an anxiety disorder, and 60% will have a sleep disturbance. The interplay between these conditions can exacerbate, exacerbate pain sensations. 
Professor Toll, who is also president of the German Pain Society, hopes that light therapy will be added to the chronic pain war chest. His patients at the Comprehensive Centre for Pain Management, for Pain Medicine, at the Technical University in Munich, are invited to spend four weeks undergoing their usual treatments, but bathed in lighting that is far brighter than normal, and tweaked to contain more of the blue spectrum while still comfortable to the eye. This project has been conducted in collaboration with Osram, the lighting company. An Osram biologist explained that the aim is to reset the body's internal 24-hour clock circadian rhythm, which when performing badly, exacerbates pain sensations. Dr. Smith is positive, but cautious about the study, which will follow 100 patients having light therapy over 18 months at Professor Toll's clinic. And since 2002, Alfredo Moser has been actually using these lights. Tell you a bit about him. Um, he's been lighting up the world. The Brazilian mechanic literally had a light bulb moment and came up with a way of illuminating his house during the day without electricity, using nothing more than plastic bottles filled with water and a tiny bit of bleach. In the last two years, the innovation has spread throughout the world and it's expected that a million homes uh, will, will be using this method by early next year. It works by refraction of the sunlight. Moser fills an empty two litre plastic bottle. He adds some bleach to the water so that it doesn't turn green with algae. And to install the bottle, he makes a hole in the roof with a drill. Then from the bottom upwards, he pushes the bottle into the newly made hole and he seals it with uh, resin, polyester resin, so that the rain doesn't come in. And here you can see the lights. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> the inspiration for the Moser lamp came to him during one of the country's frequent electricity blackouts in 2002. As the only places that had energy were the factories, not people's houses. Where he lives in Uberaba, in southern Brazil, his boss at the time suggested getting a discarded plastic bottle, filling it with water, and using it as a lens to focus the sun's rays on dry grass. That way, um, it could start a fire and as a, be a signal to rescuers. The idea stuck in Moses' head. He started playing around and filling up bottles and making circles of refracted light. Soon he had developed the lamp. Moses says, it's a divine light. God gave the sun to everyone and light is for everyone. Whoever wants it saves money. You can't get an electric shock from it and it doesn't cost a penny. And he's installed the lamps in his neighbors' houses and at the local supermarket. In the Philippines, where a quarter of the population are below the poverty line, electricity is, an un is unusually expensive. Uh, so the idea has really taken off, and Moser has now fitted 140,000 of these lamps. A charitable foundation in the Philippines has been training people since 2011 to create and install the light bottles and generate a small income. People in poor areas are also um, able to grow f food with, uh, using the lamps in small hydroponic uh, farms. So it's estimated that one million people will have be benefited from these lamps by the start of next year. That's truly extraordinary. So that's surely one of the best examples of solar power that we can think of. So I hope you found some of these light, light facts interesting, uh, if uh, you didn't know about them. So I hope that uh, you agree that it was uh, worth that small digression. And we believe that the road ahead for the ILD will be very sunny uh, in the future. And 
we hope to take our light to a much wider audience uh, through the ILD. So thanks for being a great audience and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of International Light Day. But in the meantime, I've got a few, um, um, a few slides to show you which I thought, uh, I thought you might like to see. So here's a stunning, uh, a stunning uh, slide of the Aurora Borealis. And uh, so we don't get too hemispheric. Here's one of the Aus Aurora Australis. <laughs> okay. For our friends. And um, please take in these lovely ones and just relax for a moment. Thank you very much.